Change is tough on everyone at the company, but especially HR folks. When your company is going through a big transition, your employees and leaders look to you to help maintain stability, all while you're still adjusting to the new normal yourself. So how do you steady the ship when you're still building it? This is The Culture Clinic, where my co-founder Joe and I are relentlessly learning from HR experts on how to build a culture where people love to work. My name's Skay, and I'm one of the co-founders here at Gusto. And today I'm joined by Shelly DaCosta, an HR expert in the rewards and recognition space. Hi, Shelly. Hi. Uh, so Shelly, I'm hoping that you can kind of point us in the right direction with today's topic, all about kind of change leadership and managing culture during transitions. And so my first question for you is, what's the most challenging transition period that you've ever gone through at work? Oh, wow. Challenges at work? <laughs> There's so many. Um, it feels like it's it, that, you know, the challenging transitions are whenever it's always about change, some kind of large, unfortunately, downsizing efforts in the organization. And that's actually occurred at almost every organization I've been at through my career. BlackBerry, obviously, staff reductions, huge volume there. Um, Hamilton Health Sciences, even, you know, in the public sector, we were doing staff reductions. Um years before many others were, uh, and a massive merger there with two hospitals merged with another two hospitals. At RSA in the insurance um, financial field, uh, we had staff reductions as well as a lot of mergers, acquisitions. We had the COVID transition to working at home while we were in, in the process of being purchased. That was massive. And, uh, you know, uh, any kind of change for employees that impact them personally, we were doing a lot of that at RSA as well, too. So benefits changes and pension changes that really impacted those employees. So if I have to think about it, I think the commonality is the, the most challenging ones were wherever they were affecting individuals, their future, their family, their financial security. Um, those were the ones that are most challenging for sure. Okay. And so what for you kind of is the most important skills for HR folks to, um, to have when managing during periods of transition right right off the bat I want to say empathy uh and and that's a tough one because you can't get caught up in trying to fix it for everybody but you can still have a lot of empathy for what's going on in those people's lives as a result of this change negotiation skills and that's negotiation perhaps with the employees themselves on you know different paths if you do have some choices but also negotiation at the senior management table right? Um, where HR has a seat at that table and is helping the organization negotiate and manage through that change. Do we have to do it this way? Can we do it that way? What is going on? What's, what's the impact for the employees as a result of all of that? You know, what can we bring to that table and help negotiate the best outcome so that the change can happen in a potentially good way? A um, lot of knowledge. You've got to keep up your, you know, your knowledge on, on change management, change leadership, really. Um, a lot of focus because it's easy to get distracted by the impact that this is having on the organization, employees' response to it, you know, get down in the weeds and you have to have that focus to move things along and that strategic thinking. It's really a, a constant balance between the business and what it feels is right, whether it's acquiring that company, being bought or downsizing and the employees themselves and, and trying to figure out the best path for all of that. And, and so let, let's dive into kind of uh, one of the examples. I think, you know, it's, it's fairly kind of relevant right now with macroeconomic conditions, a lot of companies kind of laying people off. Um, what, like, what are some like hard skills that HR folks could kind of like work on and, and prepare um, in advance of layoffs? I think they have to really um, understand the business so that they can have that seat at the executive table where they're listened to around the impact, right? So they have to know more than HR. They have to understand the business and what's right for the business and why the business is um, conducting what they're doing, going through this change, acquiring this company or not acquiring this company, why it's good. And they have to, they have to put that first and foremost in their minds, but at the same time, have great HR practices and great R HR knowledge about what the impact is for the employees. And there's a lot of details there that you don't realize. Um, and then to set themselves up for these kinds of changes 
really the best practice is, is to, to stick to the, the principles of your organization and have some of those lined up well in advance. Like if you've got um, a people strategy in your organization and you're, you know, you're going to have a business strategy and then like, do you have a total reward strategy? So if I think of changes we made at, um, at RSA where we were going to be making a lot of changes to the overall rewards program. Um, we had already set principles in advance that we could stick to and hold up to answer those questions and to help us as we go along. So if somebody said, oh, well, you know, if we had a senior executive saying, well, let's just, you know, close down the pension program. We'll just, we'll just, you know, close it down. Right. So it's like, no, we, you know, we said we would be competitive and affordable. We'd be transparent and well communicated. Um, it would link to performance and we would support the employee experience. You know, that doesn't support the employee experience if you do it that way. But at the same time, the business strategy is, you know, so so it's like how to do that balance. So you always had to have that knowledge of what was going on in the organization or in a merger or acquisition to truly understand the the why we were going to acquire that company and what the plus side of it was and to ensure we were brought into the process early days. So the due diligence and to understand what the implications are to suddenly acquire 400 or 200 or 20 new employees in amongst a team that you already had and what the, that would mean for the organization, for the culture, um, you know, blending that in, uh, how people are going to be received, how they're going to feel coming on board. You know, in, in some cases with a merger, it's really fascinating because the company you're merging with, you, you're then deciding, you know, what's our new culture, right? Are we going to pick up some of the things from them and apply it to us? Or are we just going to say, no, this is a total takeover and you, it's our way or the highway. You lose your brand, you lose your that, right? But there may be some really great business reasons why you are going to acquire that company, but it'll feel like an acquisition. You will... Uh, allow them to keep their brand because that brand is really important for the business. You will allow the people to keep things that are important to them as part of their culture, even though it's a little bit different from your company's culture, if you will. And then you've got to stop the yours and mine because you've now become one organization. So it sounds it sounds to me like you have to be kind of fairly decisive with things, though. And so like having some guiding principles and, and not being kind of wishy-washy about, oh, maybe we'll try this, maybe we'll, but rather we're going to make some decisions. We're going to align those with our principles and we're going to be as transparent as possible as to like why decisions were made and, and try to kind of get buy-in from employees, um, you know, with that transparency. Yes. The transparency and the communication is huge. Like I felt sort of the whole process, uh, when we were doing, for example, the benefits one or, or the pension one in particular, it brought to light as you're explaining to employees what's going to happen to their pension plan or what is involved here, that they had been hired 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, believed absolutely everything that was put in front of them and thought this company is going to take care of me from cradle to grave. So I'm going to retire from them and I'm going to be set up and I it's going to be wonderful. And it's like, when's the last time you looked at your pension statement? When's the last time you looked at any of the documents that we send? on a regular basis, do you realize what this really means for you? And so many people don't. So many people didn't. So that, you know, we then said, okay, we've got to, like, before you're going to accept what the changes are, you got to understand how the program works in the first place and then see whether, you you know, this is a good thing, a bad thing for you to accept. Because sometimes with the changes, it wouldn't be a carte blanche, close that down or do this. It might be a choice, allowing employees to have a buyout on their pension plan. Right. And so then you had to educate them on all of the implications, what that meant, so they could make a sound decision. So, you know, you were suddenly training employees on 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 the benefits programs or the pension plan or what have you, because communication and knowledge was key through the whole thing. I, I think whether it's an acquisition, whether it's a, a merger, whether it's uh, downsizing or layoffs transparency, communication, education, it just kind of makes sense. But in your experience, like, did you have any kind of like interesting kind of insights that you could share about like, how do you keep the culture aligned during periods of change? And like, 
little things that you did that might not be kind of common sense? I think I think the the is to constantly keep an open mind and just think of the volume of change that you're throwing at your employees. So I, I remember having a conversation at a, a conference with uh, a, a gentleman that was, I think he worked for Shoppers Drug Mart or he worked for Loblaws. I, I'm not going to recall right off the top of my head, but we were talking about that acquisition that had just occurred. I think it actually had occurred about six months, but it was going to be a couple of years before Loblaws would fully transition that acquisition. And basically Loblaws acquired Shoppers. But it's a really great example of shoppers, of course, kept the brand. Shoppers, of course, kept, you know, their stores in certain ways. But the little nitty gritty details. So the reason, you know, we were having the conversation was because he said that the conference, there was going to be people there from Loblaws and people there from shoppers. And it wasn't until they were at the conference that they realized that both companies handled travel negotiations and travel accommodations and all that stuff totally differently. Right? These were hotels that you could stay in if you were at Loblaws. These were hotels you could stay at if you were shopping somewhere or, or vice versa. You know what I mean? And it was just like, here's how you handle your expenses. Here's how you handle this. And these are things that are really meaningful to employees, right? Let alone the fact that now there's only going to be one head of total rewards. So is that going to be the former head of total rewards at shoppers or the former to- head of total rewards at Loblaws? or hire from outside, and what are the implications there for the teams, for the people? Now I have a new leader. I, it, it just, it you know, right down to, like I said, the travel expenses. You just don't think of all of the details. And it's not just the people's impacted, it's the systems and the policies and the processes. So we implemented an HRIS system, and we think it's the best one. And I've got five people on my team that, you know, that system is their baby. They put it in. And now we got bought by another company that says, forget it. We have XYZ system instead, and everybody's going to be moving over to that one. And so people are afraid for their jobs because their specialty was the other system. People are, you know, don't want to learn a new system. It's just there's so much change leadership. Uh, that you know, you've got to get your leaders on board for it, but you can't forget that the leaders are undergoing this change themselves. It's really, really difficult. So you remember that, you know, the marathon effect, you know, the, the senior leaders know where they're going and what the direction is. They know that, but somebody at the end of the line is going, I have no idea what that is. So you have to explain that vision. You have to create this sense of urgency, belief in the change, you know, invigorate the organization that this is the right thing to do, create that vision of what it's going to look like at the finish line. And, you know, today it's almost there is never really a finish line because we're always evolving. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of think about <clears throat> the infinite game of business, right? And Yes, absolutely. Okay. So you, you mentioned something there that kind of stuck out, stuck out to me, trying to get your leaders on board. And that might be easier kind of at the higher ranks um, during kind of like a, a merger or acquisition. But you've got all <laughs> sorts of levels of, of middle management. Um, you know, if we're talking about kind of larger organizations that, that you're merging, were you ever intentional about kind of explaining to middle level managers kind of what's in it for them? Yeah, it, it's a key piece. If you can make decisions to take away, I, I'm going to call it the fear, um, because it's really hard for people to accept change and lead others through change if they are constantly worried about the impact for themselves. So if you can take that off the table, then they as leaders can focus. They can help engage the employees. They can, you know, see it through. So where there were cases where we were actually able to either um, have decisions made that, you know, this whole line of leaders are going to be in place. At the end of the day, they still have jobs. This is what it means for them. Here's their new, you know, reward program. This is this is what their, their contract looks like. Um, and in fact, so that they're not worried and other people aren't trying to, to poach them, we might even put retention in place. Um, by the same token, there are some situations where we might say, we really want you on this change journey, but in a year and a half, there will not be a role for you at the end of this. So we're still going to put retention in place. So you stick around to help us through this, 
but you know that at the end, this is what's going to happen for you. This is what a, a package looks like. This is how we'll support you to find work afterwards, but it won't be here. Uh, so those kinds of things really, really helped for people to kind of know where they stood because there's so much uncertainty with so many other situations. So a lot of, you know, where I found HR, we would have to be the person saying, but can we make those decisions now? Can we decide that? You know, we don't have crystal balls, but we're going into this a certain way. Would that work though, kind of outlining kind of a, a timeline for people and saying like, hey, we want to help, we want you to help kind of manage the change you've got a year. Um, and here's kind of what the package will look like upon exit. Like, would those employees stay engaged? Like, how how did you manage that? It's uh, with retention, I have, you know, kind of what's in it for me and, and to put some choice and control into that. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit of a, do you want to be on board for this, knowing that it's going to be really tough or do you want out now because this is going to be too problematic, too difficult. You don't have a job at the end of it, but this is what it means. So it's, you know, it's a little bit of dangling a carrot in some ways. But it's also, to me, more about being transparent and open and honest. And and I found where people had that choice. It, it was interesting. There were people that definitely opted in. It was great for their, you know, or especially if they were um, maybe towards the end of their career and thinking of retiring or, or, or changing their, you know, their career path or something along those lines. It was like a nice little bump to say, okay, fine, right? Or the, the piece that I found people had the most difficult was is if that was an acquisition and the company was being bought, it's kind of like, okay, this is my new job if I stick around, but I don't know if I'm going to like working for this company as much as I like working for this, right? So you're, you're still, you know, kind of going into the unknown. But as we'd often say, like, everything's an unknown. We, we don't know from day to day to day whether we're going to be the buyer or be bought you know, in certain industries. <laughs> you know, I think of um, kind of the startup world where where we play, right? I mean, um, uh, many of kind of my peers and colleagues are uh, founders and uh, have exited companies. And they'll often kind of stay on for kind of a, a year or two to kind of help manage, manage that transition. And then typically kind of the acquiring company, um, you know, has proper kind of uh, retention incentives and, and bonuses for kind of a smooth transition. That was very common. For example, at BlackBerry, we, we would buy up little s- startups all the time. And when everything was really clicking, we'd buy up a startup that could do this, a startup. And we would have a different approach to acquisitions based on the company. I can I can remember a senior leader at one point in time saying, most of the time when we're acquiring these smaller companies, we're bringing them in and we're the parents. We're going to call the shots we're going to say this is the way it's going to be. They're going to know what their package is. And, you know, some of them, you're right. They'll stay on board for a year because that's what we've negotiated. Then they go and do their next startup for us to buy them again in six months or another couple of years. Um, <clears throat> but there was other groups, uh, QNX. I remember when, when BlackBerry was buying them and they were advanced and it was what we needed. It was a different scenario. It was like, okay, it's a bit of a hands-off. They're allowed to keep a lot of theirs. You know, we, we said, we're not the parents here. We're the parents, but they're adult children we just bought. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we, they're living in our garage <laughs> type of a scenario, and there's only so many things that we can control. And in those scenarios, it was great in HR to kind of find out about their culture and find out about their details. It was the same thing with RSA and Johnson. Because maybe there's some great things we can learn from that and we can bring it into our culture. So that's where, you know, what was originally an acquisition, I came on board and said to another company that I worked for, was this an acquisition or a merger? Because it feels like a merger. We let them keep everything and do their own thing. And they're like a whole separate culture. And somebody said, no, it was an acquisition. But the more you start to understand about them and the business, the more you'll see why that was a good decision. Talk to me about that. Why why do companies choose to kind of go that route with where where they don't kind of fully merge the companies like what what are the you know what are the big driving factors for executive team so a lot of times it's brand right so in the insurance industry that's a brand that's well known all the clients all the customers that whole side of the country 
is linked to that brand. And if you suddenly change that, there it can't, you know, it won't won't go over all that well. Um, so it's, you know, just a cost, a branding kind of a scenario. Sometimes it's how the acquisition is set up, that the agreement with the founder of the other company that you're acquiring is the only way I will allow you to acquire us or I will go with this deal. It, you know, it's because it's not a hostile takeover. This is an acquisition type of a thing. Is if we keep our brand for 10 years, you keep, you know, 80% of the employees on board for this. Like it all depends on the negotiation and how badly you want that company in your, whether it's stable of insurance brokers or, or whatever you're, you're purchasing. So, it, you know, there'd be some very solid business agreements. I, what I found was certain situations, though, where it seemed so lucrative to have that company, especially if they were a company somebody else wanted to buy. And so then there's a bit of a, ha, we got them, you didn't get them. And then we would get into it and go, oh, boy, like, we didn't do enough due diligence around do we really want them? Do you realize that this system's broken? This isn't this way. They don't align with our culture. So, you know, it's not a matter of easily to turn around and say, what you stand for is not what we stand for. Come on, change your thinking, change your values, right? All the employees are like, no, that's why I'm, right? So there was always some ahas when you kind of rip off the bandaid and go, I wish we had been brought in at that due diligence stage at the early days to have that, those conversations or find out more about their, their HR policies and their people policies and their people strategy. Does that happen? Uh, like, have you ever been brought in kind of during due diligence to kind of do a, a, like a, a culture audit to see whether it would it would be a fit? Less of a culture audit and more of a how do your programs work? Um, what have you got in place? Um, you know, all the data on all of their employees and uh, their length of service and their pension plans and all of that. Because, you know, it's it's OK, we're going to acquire this company of 200 people and they have two unions and three pension plans. We already have six of our own. <laughs> and pension plans aren't easy things to open up and merge together and all of those kinds of stuff. So like, it's it's just like, is it worth all of that headache in that administration when the real the reality is, is you were acquiring that company to save money? But now if you're gonna have to be running separate systems because your systems don't go together or you have to put in a brand new system, was it, really a good decision. So have you found it easier to kind of manage positive changes or like mergers and acquisitions versus negative changes like downsizing layoffs? How does your kind of approach change in leadership depending on the situation? I think your principles of leadership of change, you know, change leadership stay, right? You're still creating that sense of urgency. You're still going to kind of inspire belief in the change. It's tougher when it's something like just pure downsizing, you know, you're losing your job, you're, you're communicating that to some cases, hundreds of employees. That's hard to build a, a great case and invigorate the organization for the change, right? There you are pulling on all of your empathy skills and you're doing everything you can to make that go well, to treat those employees with compassion and treat them the right way and fairly and go through all of that. And then your a lot of your change leadership is for your employees that are left behind. So they pick up the pieces and move along and they understand why you did what you did or why you had to go that route. Um, they're all difficult because, you know, even what you think is going to be, oh, this is great. We're going to acquire this company. Those employees have now come over and become your employees. And in HR, you are now then trying to lead them through that change. Your, you know, your other employees were like, oh, it's great. We just acquired two new companies. That's fine. We're the leaders. Look at us. But the others are going, yeah, we just got acquired with the interest. And they're like always looking over their shoulder. So you're doing the change of leadership with them and helping them bring along, you know, mourn what they lost, but at the same time celebrate coming on board and what's great about your organization, creating that new vision, the new normal, et cetera. You know, two things that kind of stand out to me, um, one, just a, a renewed commitment to kind of employee listening. And so whether, no matter the change, what change you're kind of going through, providing different ways for employees to kind of have a voice, ask questions, 
be very kind of transparent and public and kind of answering those questions. So anytime, you know, we've gone through kind of big changes here at Gusto, you know, we'll have kind of uh, an all hands meeting. Uh, employees can come on and uh, ask questions live or submit questions anonymous, uh, anonymously and we'll come and answer those. Um, you know, the other one that I think is really important for kind of keeping employee engagement is making sure that you're not kind of asking employees to just put more and more and more on their plate. You know, especially if you're kind of going through, well, either a downsizing or a merger and acquisition, uh, <clears throat> but rather talking about how we're reprioritizing kind of what, you know, what we're doing and and saying like, hey, we're going to ask you, you know, we, we said goodbye to kind of uh, some folks here. Um, we need to kind of figure out what is essential from the work they were doing and, and distribute that. But let's look at kind of what we're all doing. And, and if we're adding something to the plate, let's take something off the plate so that we're kind of reprioritizing. Yeah, absolutely. Skinny. That's, that's so key because, it, you know, really this kind of change leadership and acquisition and merger, all of those should be handled like a massive project in the organization. And anytime a new project comes on, unfortunately, some organizations have the tendency to, okay, just add this extra work on. And it's no, we should be stopping and strategically thinking about all of our other priorities and saying, can we push this to Q4? Can we push this to here? Because our leaders are now going to be more occupied than ever helping people, responding to questions, being there for them, listening, reading, doing things to, to help them understand why we're doing what we're doing, learning about this new organization learning about their new employees, whatever it is, it's taking up a ton of time. And it's it's just important to carve that out because this is the most important thing the organization is working on right now. So it's like, you know, the business has to run, but can we really, as you said, juggle priorities and, and potentially carve that time out by putting some things on a back burner for a period of time and giving employees that okay to do that with their priorities and their goals. And I'd be interested to know, uh, Shelley, whether um, you've ever used kind of recognition strategically to kind of manage change and and how you might have kind of leveraged recognition programs to kind of reinforce certain behaviors. Or I know we've talked a lot about kind of uh, values, right? Like if you're <clears throat> putting in kind of new values to the organization, recognition is a great way to kind of reinforce those. But let's talk through kind of um, either kind of mergers, acquisitions, layoffs, how you might have used recognition to kind of manage through those those changes. Yeah, I, I absolutely. It's a great opportunity to relaunch a program of recognition because now you're explaining it or educating a whole new group of employees to it, perhaps now that you've acquired them and and having them understand what it means. It can be used as a welcome gift to the organization, right? You can use that in in, you know, if you've got budget to do that kind of thing. And then actually orient them to the program. Uh, and this is what we use it for. And use it as an opportunity to teach about your values and behaviors in the organization. Because if that's what your recognition tool is rewarding, then what better way to kind of link that in for them is to say, you know, this is what's really important to us at Company XYZ. And this is what we reward at Company XYZ. And here's the new, you know, so right now, um, we're rewarding all of you for coming on board and your positive attitude. In future, these are the kinds of things your leaders are going to be looking for in your behaviors, in our values, and how we work together um, for future recognition. You know, and so therefore, you're teaching, you're you're linking them in, you're orienting it, et cetera. Um, unless you know, I haven't used it because more often people are all around. You know, cash is king, so to speak. But whether or not you could use um, reward programs of recognition programs for retention through tough times you know what i mean to actually have a retention gift if you stay the course for the next six months when it's been really difficult uh you know parts of your celebrations parts of your goodbyes those kinds of things um i know it's often been uh difficult in certain programs um, where a company is closing down or making a transition or whatever to merge programs because they've got one recognition, somebody's got something else, and points make that really, really crazy. So if you have the opportunity to switch from a points plan before you acquire or whatever, I would say do it. Uh, 
because it, it just makes it, they, you know, it doesn't, the two programs don't always speak to one another and people are kind of a t- tied to that because they've been collecting and saving for things. So there's a, there's a myriad of ways um, to keep using it. You know, I, I think about kind of like in the very kind of short term, kind of immediate um, challenges, right? Of, of whether you're kind of downsizing or kind of doing a merger and acquisition and how you might be able to leverage recognition. You know, if, if people are kind of picking up work that, you know, wasn't typically on their plate, you know, going going the extra mile to kind of make sure that that's getting recognized and that those people kind of feel appreciated for that that extra effort or just the uncertainty that people are feeling or um, it, maybe the feeling like, oh, like our company, just like over a bunch of people, you know, they don't, they don't really appreciate employees as, as humans, um, you know, taking the time to recognize people for their contributions in, in kind of the weeks and months uh, following kind of a big change uh, can, have a, can have a really big impact. And then the lastly, if there is kind of a, a merger or acquisition and there is, like you mentioned, kind of like a lot of training required to kind of learn the, uh, uh, the values of the other organization or maybe just like some of the processes, if there are training modules in place or, or uh, playbooks, rewarding people for kind of taking the time to kind of like go through those and learn those um, could be an effective way of using recognition programs. Sure, for sure. As you said, you know, it's, or we said it's a big project, but think of all the micro projects there are as a result of it. You know, it's putting in the new system, it's aligning the new uh, uh, travel policy, right? It's it's all of those things. And to reward people for being on that project, to, to be there, to do that to jump in and say, we're creating a new company here um, and you can be part of it and here's your reward for it. Or, you know, it's there, it can be that finite sword between throwing a lot of dollars at things with some employees because you, you just never know the experience where somebody's coming from. And I've actually had somebody turn around and say, well, if we didn't spend this there, could we have kept those employees? Could we have, you know what I mean? And it's like, no, there were strategic business decisions why those employees, you know, and they were treated fairly, et cetera. The money that we're using to reward you now for still being here is, you know, it's almost like a different pot, so to speak, for people to understand that because there is guilt involved in, you know, I'm I'm still here, I still have a job, et cetera. So, you know, it, using recognition in a really good way that way, you can you can help reward recognition and rewards doesn't always have to be it, it doesn't have to be monetary um and if it is monetary it doesn't need to be huge either right like hey you picked up kind of an extra piece of work that was on somebody's plate um you know it's at ten dollars like hey grab grab coffee on me kind of tomorrow kind of thing right like it doesn't need to be uh hundreds of dollars to be impactful yes for sure sure um, so so shelly kind of uh in in summary to kind of wrap up here did you have kind of one one takeaway from this conversation um, that we can kind of lead folks with about how they might think about kind of approaching kind of big changes in their organization? I think it's, there's so many things to do. It's a lot around listening to your employees, knowing your organization, right? Understanding the organization and what works for them in terms of how you're going to hear feedback, how to communicate to them, their level of, of knowledge in the process, how they want to be treated, all of those kinds of things. So so that's that kind of almost ear to the ground. You have to know your business and know your employees. And then you've got to apply those, you know, values and beliefs and principles and, and change leadership principles. You know, um, it, it's tough. And if there are things and people that you can, take care of in the process so that they can help you as well. So it's not just HR leading through this. Um, That's really important as well. So if you can, you know, if you can calm the waters by, by being transparent about certain processes or a timeline or change or to say, you know, the cuts are done. We're not going to be making any more cuts. You know, we, we don't see any more cuts in the future linked to this project, what have you. You know, there was always some leader that didn't want to do that because they never knew, if, you know, we might have to terminate so-and-so tomorrow, but that was for a different thing. It was it was like to be able to kind of 
calm people down. And if you can do that, that was really important. But, you know, you got to keep listening, leading and supporting through the change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the big thing that stuck out to me that you emphasized um, was just how important it was to kind of have all of your leaders. So like all of your middle management on board and, and really communicating to them kind of what what's in it for them, right? Like if they're going to be going kind of you know, helping to kind of manage through this change, how are how are they going to kind of come out the other end of that? Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, this has been a great conversation. Thanks, Shelly. And I uh, will look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thanks, Gay. Take care. If you want to build a great place to work, check out Culture is the Ultimate Advantage, our free guide to creating a culture where people feel seen, heard, and valued. Click the link in the description to get your copy. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please hit that like button and be sure to subscribe so you won't miss a future episode. Don't forget to recognize somebody for a job well done today. Mucho gusto.